part two, reading on. Um, airtight case. I mean, this is just the tip of the iceberg, too. I mean, <clears throat> excuse me, I have a bit of a cold. Uh, the British, hands down, are uh, the number one sponsors of terror, creation of terror, deployment of terror, training of terror, funding of terror. Uh, but let's just dive into part two here. Maybe I can finish it up. Uh, reading on. The Liberation Tigers of Tamil Elam, LTTE, known as the Tamil Tigers, have carried out a decade-long terror campaign against the government of Sri Lanka in which they have killed an estimated 130,000 people. In addition, LTTE was responsible for the suicide bomber murder of former Indian Prime Minister Rajiv Gandhi on the 21st of May 1991, and the similar assassination of Sri Lankan President Rana Singh Premadasa on the 1st of May 1993. Since 1984, the LTTE, International Secretariat, has been located in London. The official spokesman for the Secretariat is Anton Balsingham, an Oxford, uh, Oxford University graduate and former British, <coughs> excuse me, former British Foreign Office employee. Uh, the British Foreign Office <laughs> is in the middle of literally everything. My God. Uh, at the center of it all, always, you know, all roads lead to the, to the BFO. Uh, the group's Suicide Bomber Division, the Black Tigers, which killed Rajiv Gandhi, is run by Panpan Ajith out of LTTE London headquarters, another elite suicide bomber cell. The Sky Tigers, which employs light aircraft, is coordinated by Dr. Maheswaran, also based in London. Most of the marching orders for LTTE terrorist operations in the Indian subcontinent are delivered from London via a string of LTTE publications, including Tamil Nation and Hot Spring, published in London, and Network and Kalatil, published in Surrey. The organization's chief fundraiser and banker, Lawrence Tilligar, is also based in London. Similarly, the Islamic resistance movement Hamas, here we go, maintains its publishing operations in London, including a monthly organ, Philistine al Muslima. In 1996, this publication is issued a fatwa, religious ruling, calling for terrorist attacks against Israel. On February 25th and March 3rd, shortly after the fatwa was published, Hamas suicide bombers blew up two Jerusalem buses and a Tel Aviv market, killing 55 people. Funding of these terrorists, who were part of the military wing Izeddin al Qassam, comes from London, where Interpol is the chief money arm of the group. It says Interpal. I have to check that out. Excuse me, I haven't looked into that, whether that's a typo. <laughs> I mean, my God, anything's possible. Interpol could indeed be, uh, you know, look, I mean, the Red Cross, what? They're, they've been implicated in organ trafficking? Adrenochrome, I think. Uh, so Interpol, who knows what they're doing? Uh, that's a whole other episode. Uh, in the case of the Kurdish Workers' Party, PKK, the British government played an even more direct role in supporting the 17-year war against the Turkish government by the Turkish separatists. An estimated 19,000 people have been killed in southeast Turkey since the PKK launched its terror war in 1983. In May 1995, after the PKK was expelled from Germany for seizing control 
of Turkish diplomatic buildings in 18 European cities, the British government licensed Med TV in London, through which the PKK broadcasts four hours a day into its enclaves inside Turkey and all over Europe. In a March 1996 broadcast, PKK leader Apo Okalan called for the execution of German Chancellor Helmut Kohl and his foreign minister Klaus Kinkel. And when the PKK held its founding parliament in exile in Belgium in 1995, three members of the British House of Lords either attended or sent personal telegrams of endorsement. The three were Lord Hilton, Lord Avebury, and Baroness Gould. The same Lord Avebury has been an active backer of the Peru support group in London, which has served as a major in international fundraising front for the Peruvian narco-terrorist group Shining Path, Sendero Luminoso. When Adolfo Hector Olachea was dispatched by Shining Path to London in July 1992 to establish the Foreign Affairs Bureau, he received a letter of recognition from Buckingham Palace, which he circulated widely. The letter read in part, quote, The private secretary is commanded by Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth to acknowledge receipt of the letter from Mr. Olea Chair and to say that it has been passed on to the Home Office. The fatwa against American targets. On February 10th, 1998, a group of well-known London-based Islamists, quote-unquote, and Islamic, Islamic organizations issued a fatwa calling for terrorist attacks against American targets. Against American targets. All right, so we're moving on. Britain has long, ever since the revolution, they've been engaged in terrorism against the United States. Um, probably you could uh, not argue, but you would be correct in claiming that the assassination of Abraham Lincoln, the subsequent assassinations of um, <clears throat> every president we've had that has departed from uh, up to Kennedy has been um, um, targeted by uh, British intelligence. <clears throat> they're absolutely terrified of, uh, of course, now you, you might argue that the, the American Republic is dead in that impulse, that healthy, uh, pro-human, arguably nationalist impulse has now been completely um, extinguished under the new Biden regime. But, um, you know, it carries on in the people, but it doesn't seem to me that the people have the wherewithal to, to sort of reignite any kind of uh, meaningful uh, Republican revolution. Uh, but anyway, uh, let's go back to the text. Um, calling for terrorist attacks against American targets. It was signed by Saudi terrorist supporter Mohammed al-Masari and Omar Bakri, head of the Al Mujahirun and was endorsed by 60, 60 organizations that are based in the United Kingdom. It instructed uh, Muslims living in the United States, quote, you have to fir you have uh, first to renounce the residency or acquire citizenship, then start military activities if physically capable. You are then at liberty to fight them everywhere in the world or re-enter the realm clandestinely and wreak havoc, obviously facing charges as spy, terrorists, etc. Yes. Risk. Unquote. On 23rd of February 1998, a second fatwa was issued entitled, quote, World Islamic Front's statement urging jihad against Jews and crusaders. It called for uh, killing Americans because their, quote, occupation of the Holy Arab Peninsula in Jerusalem and their oppressing 
the Muslim nations, unquote. The fatwa, which was widely reported in the London-based Arabic daily Al-Quds Al-Arabi, was signed by Sheikh Osama bin Laden, who, despite his current residence in Afghanistan, continues to maintain a lavish mansion in London. Ayman al-Zawahiri, head of the Islamic group behind the November 1997 massacre at Luxor, Egypt, Abu Yasser Rifai Ahmad Taha, another leader of the Islamic group residing in London, and Sheikh Mir Hamza, secretary of the Jamiat ul Ulema e of Pakistan, um, Pakistan. Two days before the 7th of August 1998 bombings of the U.S. Embassy in Dar el Salam, da, excuse me, Dar es Salam, Tanzania, and Nairobi, Kenya, the Islamic Jihad issued a declaration targeting American interests all over the world. The communique accused the CIA of cooperating with Egyptian officials to capture three members of the group in Albania and ex extradite them to Egypt, where they face prosecution on capital offenses. Within hours of the two bombings, a number of London-based groups issued endorsements of the bombings. Supporters of Sharia, headed by Abu Hamza al-Misri, an Egyptian who was convicted of a capital offense in Egypt but who enjoys political asylum in London, issued one of the most virulent endorsements. Omar Bakri, head of Al-Muhajirun, as well as the Islamic Observation Center, the Islamic Jihad Organization's official propaganda and fundraising organization in London, also endorsed the bombings. The Islamic Observation Center was officially licensed by the British government in 1996 to carry out activities in Britain. Attacks on Yemen. In the third week of December 1998, a London-based terrorist groups excuse me, a London-based terrorist group was planning to launch operations to destabilize the Republic of Yemen. Members of the Ansar al-Sharia, directed from London by Mustafa Kamel, also known as Abu Hamza al-Masri, a British citizen and former Afghani Mujahideen who trains, Mujahideen who trains groups of young people for terrorist activities at his Finbury Mosque in North London, were arrested on the 23rd of December 1998 in Yemen as they were planning armed terrorist operations. These operations were in contact with the Islamic army of Abin Aden, affiliated with the London-based Egyptian Islamic Jihad, which had kidnapped 16 British and Australian tourists a few days earlier. A rescue operation on December 29th by the Yemeni security forces resulted in the kidnappers killing three British hostages, one Australian. Twelve tourist, tourists were freed. British press and later government officials accused the Yemeni security forces of provoking the murders because they refused to negotiate with the terrorists. In response, the Yemeni authorities did not mince words. In one day, Yemeni kicked out the British Scotland Yard officers who had been invited to observe the investigations, withdrew its application to join the British Commonwealth, excellent move, and announced that a group of British citizens had been arrested while attempting a massive terror bombing campaign in Aden. Uh, in, on January 25th, Yemen President Ali Abdullah Saleh demanded from British uh, Prime Minister Tony Blair that Abu Hamza al-Masri be handed over for trial in Yemen on charges of carrying out terrorist attacks in Yemen and several other Arab states. The London-based daily Al-Hayat reported that, according to government sources in Sana'a, Yemen's capital... The message from President Saleh stressed that the Yemeni government has the right to demand that the British government hand over Abu Hamza and evidence and documents which prove its, descrip its description of Abu, of, of Abu Hamza as a terrorist 
and extremist. However, British law does not consider it a crime for individuals and groups based in London to plan, incite, or conduct terrorist activities outside Her Majesty's domains. Former diplomat, that's very interesting. Form formal diplomatic protests to London. This British harboring of international terrorist groups has not gone unnoticed by the nations that have been the targets of this brutality. To date, the British Foreign Office has received formal diplomatic protests from at least 10 victimized countries. These include Egypt, British asylum for the Islamic group and Islamic Jihad has been a persistent reason for Egyptian complaints to the British government. In April 96, Egyptian Interior Minister Hassan al-Alfi told the British Arabic weekly Al-Wasat, quote, all terrorists come from London. They exist in other European countries, but they all start from London, unquote. On August 29th, the government daily Al-Akhram reported that the British charge d'affaires in Cairo was summoned by the Deputy Foreign Minister and given a letter for Foreign Minister Malcolm Rifkind protesting Britain's double standard policy and support for international terrorism. An official of the Egyptian Foreign Ministry was quoted in the paper saying, Quote, the asylum law in Britain has provided a safe haven for terrorists. Unquote. Following the Luxor massacre, Egyptian President Hosni Mubarak launched a personal international crusade to spotlight the role of the British government in harboring and sponsoring the terrorists who have been targeted, who have targeted Egypt. It's interesting how now nothing, absolutely nothing, nobody talks about the British except a couple of videos I saw the other day uh, where you know, they found uh, British soldiers in, in Israel fighting and wondering, you know, uh, ultimately won't this trigger some uh, international legal mechanism and what the hell are they doing there? Uh, going on, Israel, next Next country, Israel. On March 3rd, 1996, after a Hamas bomb exploded in a Jerusalem market, killing a dozen people, and a second bomb exploded in Tel Aviv, Israel's ambassador to London met with Foreign Minister Rifkind to demand that Britain stop protecting the group. In an account of that confrontation, the London Express reported the next day, quote, Israeli security sources say the fanatics behind the bombing are funded and controlled through secret, secret cells operating there. Only days before the latest terror campaign began, military chiefs in Jerusalem detailed how Islamic groups raised £7 million in donations from British organizations. The ambassador Moshe Raviv yesterday shared Israel's latest information about the Hamas operations. Uh, let's see, source at the, what did I, did I skip something there? No, sorry. A source at the Israeli embassy said last night, <laughs> get this, it is not the first time we've pointed out that Islamic terrorists are in Britain, unquote. The British Foreign Office officially responded to the Israeli ambassador. We have seen no proof to support allegations that funds raised by Hamas in the UK are used directly in support of terrorist acts elsewhere. Ludicrous. It doesn't matter how much evidence piles up. These people are able to burrow more deeply such that, you know, today, you know, 
perhaps myself, a couple other people I know are even saying the word British in reference uh, to, to Israel these days, or to anything going on in the world. Ukraine, come on. How is it that they've managed to uh, to, to uh, actually, you know, uh, you 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 would think that the truth is being exposed gradually over the years, but you know what has fascinated me is you go back 20, 30, 40 years, you see that actually uh, they were more exposed uh, back then, and now it's like me, I'm just like some kind of a nut for bringing this stuff up. Just I'm just a. I'm just a, actually just a complete nutcase. And back then, you see, just 20 years ago, 23 years ago, people were acknowledging this as a problem. <coughs> In early September 1997, Shin Bet Chief Ami Ayalong traveled to Britain, according to the Sunday Telegraph, after investigations determined that the two Hamas suicide bombers who killed 15 people in a Jerusalem market on the 30th of July arrived in Israel on British passports. Quote, Israeli officials are said to have become increasingly frustrated by what they see as British foot dragging in curbing the activities of Palestinian hardliners. The Israeli government has made repeated calls for action to be taken against militants said to be operating freely in the British capital. <clears throat> France. In late 1995, the armed Islamic groups, GIA's London headquarters ordered a terror war against France, leading France to loudly protest to the British government, according to the 6th of November 1995 London Daily Telegraph in an article entitled Britain Harbors Paris bomber. Algeria also filed strong protests to the British Foreign Office over the harboring of the GIA in London. Peru, the Peruvian government, has made repeated requests to the British government since 1992, demanding the extradition of Adolfo Hector Olaechea, Olaechea, Ola Echea, the London-based head of overseas operations for Shining Path, as well as the shutdown of its fundraising and support operations there. Both requests have been refused to this day. Turkey. On the 20th of August, 1996, the Turkish government formally protested to the British government for allowing the Kurdish Workers' Party to continue its London-based med TV broadcasts into Turkey, despite documentation that the broadcasts were being used to convey marching orders to PKK terrorists there. Germany, the Bonn government also issued a diplomatic note to London following a March 1996 med TV broadcast in which the PKK leader Apo Okalan called for the murder of German Chancellor Kohl and Foreign Minister Kinkel. Yemen. In January 1999, the government of Yemen filed formal diplomatic protests with Britain for harboring the terrorists who carried out bombings and kidnappings. Russia. On the 14th of November 1999, the Russian Foreign Ministry filed a formal protest to Andrew Wood, Britain's ambassador in Moscow, after two Russian television journalists were brutally beaten as they attempted to film a London conference where bin Laden's International Islamic Front, Ansar As Sharia, Al Muhajirun, and other Islamist groups called for a jihad against Russia <clears throat> in retaliation for the Russian military actions in Chechnya. One of the victims of the beating ORT cameraman, Alexander Panov, told Kommersant Daily that he was very surprised at the indifference of the British government, and, uh, 
going on. Some of the participants at the charity event were people wanted by Interpol, but Scotland Yard, although evidently aware of their residence in Britain, does not react. Hmm. On November 10th, 1999, the Russian government had already filed a formal diplomatic démarche via the Russian embassy in London protesting the attacks on the Russian journalists and also the admission by Sheikh Omar Bakri Mohammed, the head of the political wing of the Bin Laden organization Al-Muhajirun, that the group was recruiting Muslims in England to go to Chechnya to fight the Russian army. Bakri's organization operates freely from offices in the London suburb of Lee Valley, where they occupy two rooms at a local computer center and maintain their own internet company. Bakri has admitted that retired, quote-unquote, British military officers are training new recruits in Lee Valley before they are sent off to camps in Afghanistan or Pakistan or are smuggled directly into Chechnya. Reminds me a lot of the the uh, British, uh, uh, what is it, The uh, maybe the SAS were involved in training uh, Gladio operatives. First they trained them, then they set up a training camp in Sardinia, but originally it was in... Uh, was in the UK. Same thing, right? On November 20th, 1999, the Daily Telegraph admitted, following the release of the US State Department's updated list of foreign terrorist organizations that, quote, Britain is now an international center for Islamic militancy on a huge scale, and the capital is the home to a bewildering variety of radical Islamic and fundamentalist movements, many of which make no secret of their commitment to violence and terrorism to achieve their goals. So again, my thesis here, and I think it's it's uh, undeniable if you really if you dig down and look at everything, is that the uh, Islamic Jihad, these uh, these groups are not organic, they're sponsored, or they're funded, they're trained, the, and ideologically stoked by British intelligence. They don't really represent Islam. Uh, going on, India. In December, let's see, make sure this isn't too long. Okay. Um, in December... 1999, following the conclusion of the Indian Airlines hijacking, the Indian government protested the fact that British officials publicly stated that they would allow one of the freed Kashmiri terrorists, Ahmed Omar Sheikh, to return to London because there, quote, were no charges filed against him in Britain. Hmm. But... It's not illegal in Britain to do what he was doing, right? Uh, the British government, facing growing international pressure, apparently has backed down from this decision. Going on. Um, okay, uh, well, here we are. That's the end of it. Um... Uh, Strategy of tension, that's interesting. That's how, that's how the British Empire manages the world. It's through a strategy of tension. There's tension everywhere. We're all feeling it. We're all stressed out. Whether it's, it's nonsense like uh, COVID or um, eat the bugs or, you know, whatever it is. Um, the tension is real. And whatever internal intention, uh, whatever um, internal tensions we have as human beings, that is something we can control. And we would do well to control, to manage, to go within ourselves and to um, heal sources of tension that might come from... from uh, from very deep down, uh, so that we can be more attentive, more alert, more proactive 
in combating the uh, the external to the extent that you can differentiate. I mean, there are some internal tensions that we have that actually have as sources very deliberate uh, um, uh, operations, of course, uh, through Tavistock or other kinds of psychological warfare being perpetrated, they can cause inner, uh, a lot of um, inner duress. And so let's, let's do our best to um, overcome and transcend those things and become uh, stronger, better versions of ourselves. Otherwise, this whole thing, we're just, we're just not going to, uh, there's no hope. So let's, <clears throat> we can all, we can all try to be uh, super versions of ourselves. Nothing is going to stop us from that.